Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure Immaculate Ahlul Bayt During the last two nights we've been introducing the concept of Tasawwuf, Sufism or Irfan and then we went into the practical dimension seeing that saying that we have to see huwa al wal akhiru wal dahiru wal batin taste the first the last the outer the inner seeing beyond the physical world in the hu il munqib fa huwa yara seeing the metaphysical then we said, how do we see it? We have to be born twice. How are we born twice? We have to eliminate the ego. How do we eliminate the sorry? How do we eliminate the ego? Fatabeuni. The Holy Prophet said, Follow me. Then last night we covered the importance of why this particular figure has to be followed. And we to some extent open the concept of infallibility which has six or seven or maybe more rational proofs in addition to the textual proofs of infallibility but we opened one of them last night and I won't open that further but this obedience to the Holy Prophet and this following the Holy Prophet this has to be explained now don't forget the plot. The plot is to eliminate the ego. This is the method. The Holy Messenger has said, Ashariato Aqwali Wattariqato Afali Walhaqiqato Ahwali. The Sharia are my words. The Tariqa are my actions. And the haqiqa are or is my state. I just want to open this up to some degree. Obedience to the Holy Prophet, which is what we want to do, takes three forms to it. The first step and the most essential step, albeit a superficial step, is the sharia. The words. The statements that the Prophet gives to us in relation to the Vajabat and refraining from the Muharramat, the sins, the letter of the law has to be abided by and that's the Sharia. And this is important. And one can never let go of this dimension of religion. Because Allah has attributes of majesty, Jalali attributes. And He has attributes of beauty, Jamali attributes. One has to have both. One has to be with Allah through both attributes, both groups of attributes. You can't get engrossed or drowned in Allah's attributes of beauty and forget that he is the conqueror, the leader, one who takes revenge and so on and so forth, one who has wrath. It's like a son whose father is a scholar. He becomes so cozy with his scholar, Ayatollah father, for example. After a while, he doesn't listen to the father because he's now so cozy with him. He gets drowned in the attribute of love, compassion, sympathy of the father who's a scholar and may not even listen to the father after getting drowned in that in those attributes of beauty. The same applies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we get drowned in the attributes of beauty suddenly we reach a stage where well, maybe this action isn't wajib. There's no need to do salat. There's no need to do x, y or z wajib action. And we 
have Sufis who segregate themselves from the Sharia, it's because of this. They've become drowned in the attributes of Jamal and they've discarded the attributes of Jalal. And that's why the Ma'sumin, they, until the very end, or be they Ma'sum, would always observe the attributes of Allah's Jalali attributes. And therefore they would always do the Rajabat and always refrain from the Muharramat, or be they Ma'sum. They're under the authority of Allah's law, Allah's leadership. They're scared of going against it. Anyway, the Sharia is the letter of the law. It's the superficial dimension, but it's the first step. Islam may have, Islam may have hundreds of steps, but without this first step, you can't progress smoothly or completely. It will be deficient. However, the problem is that we shouldn't confine religion to the Vajabat and the Muharramat. And this is a difficulty that we're facing today. People see religion confined to the letter of the law. That's problematic. One is limiting religion to the letter of the law as if it's the be all and end all. And that's not only limiting one's religion, but one will be wasting one's soul. There are many things that are outside the jurisdiction of the Vajibat and the Muharramat, the obligatory actions and the sins. Islam has innumerable esoteric, inner, deep layers, ethical, irfani. And you just confine religion to the letter of the law. That's going to manifest negatively some way down one's life. There are many people who maybe they do all the vajibat, they refrain from all the sins, but they're still very bad people. They don't know how to speak with their husbands, wives, children, with their neighbor, at the workplace. Even if, if they do all the vajibat, they refrain from all the muharramat, but they're very unethical. They hold on to grudges, that's not haram. And many other sins, ethical sins, they may be they're just contaminating to the soul and they just keep looking at the letter of the law. The letter of the law is meant to be a conduit to deeper realms of Islam. It's meant to be a conduit a route to recalling Allah. But if you look at the letter of the law as an ends in itself, it's going to cause problems. Every action in the Sharia is meant as a route to Allah, a conduit, a way to Allah, recalling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I gave this example in Chicago, and I know many people from Dearborn were there. I do apologize, but I think it's important just to give one example of how it becomes problematic when you stick to the letter of the law without looking beyond. And that's the example of the wudu, where wudu, it's you wash two parts of the body and you wipe two parts of the body. Is it only meant to be a washing and wiping process? Is that it? Or ghusl, for example. Is it yet a specific order that has to be abided? Is the only thing in ghusl just to you know, wash in a specific order? Is there nothing beyond that? The answer is there's a lot beyond these actions. All of these actions in the wudu and the ghusl, everything else, they have esoteric dimensions behind them. And Allah wants us to get to those dimensions through the wudu. Now you may say, why the wudu in such a shape? 
But you have to start with something tangible. Hello? This is just a means to something greater, deeper. But it has to be tangible. Salat is the same. Five salats a day, it's a minimum. It's a conduit to recalling Allah. If there was no salat made wajib, we'll all forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it starts with something tangible. Rukul positions, sajda positions, but they, they themselves aren't the ends. The ends is the meaning behind them. The esoteric dimensions, the budon. Now in wudu we see many people, they keep on washing and keep on washing themselves. If you look at only the letter of the law, either of two things will happen. Either eventually you'll say, what is all this about? And you'll forget the whole thing. Or you'll acquire waswas and obsession. Because when there's no inner meaning, can you keep on washing, particularly it's important, every part of the body has to be washed and so on and so forth. Without having any understanding why you're doing it, you're going to acquire obsession, waswas. That's the satanic. You're in the satanic jurisdiction now. Getting out of that is almost impossible. I just want to give one tradition in relation to the wudu. It's a hadith of Qudsi, a sacred tradition, where Allah reveals, but it's the Holy Prophet's words, in contrast to the Qur'an, where Allah reveals and it's Allah's words. Here Allah says, Man ahdatha wa lam yatawadha فَقَدْ جَفَانِي Whoever's wudu is nullified, for example, by means of sleep, or going to the lavatory, and they don't do the wudu after the wudu becomes void, verily they have abandoned me, Allah. They've abandoned Allah. وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ Whoever's wudu is nullified, whoever becomes a muhdith. وَتَوَدَّعَ But they do the wudu after their wudu has been nullified. وَلَمْ يُسَلِّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ فَقَدْ جَفَانِ But they don't execute two units of prayer after doing the wudu. Allah says they've abandoned me. وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ وَتَوَدَّعَ وَسَلَّوْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ Now someone, their wudu has become nullified. They do the wudu, they do the two units of prayer, but they don't supplicate after the two units of prayer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَقَدْ جَفَانِي Allah says they've abandoned me. وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ وَتَوَدَّعَ وَسَلَّوْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ وَدَعَانِي But someone who becomes muhdith, the wudu becomes nullified. And then they do the wudu, they do two units of prayer after it, and they supplicate after the two units of prayer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَمْ أَجِبْهُ and I, Allah, don't answer to them if they do all these things I don't answer them فِيمَا سَأَلَنِي مِنْ أَمْرِ دِينِهِ وَدُنْيَا I don't answer them in relation to that which they ask in matters of the world and their religion فَقَدْ جَفَوْتُهُ I, Allah, have abandoned them وَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّنْ جَافِ and I'm not an abandoning Lord. Now, why should something that is only washing and wiping lead to a, a set of actions that Allah will not let abandon you and whatever you want in matters of your religion and dunya, Allah will give. Why? What's the relationship here? Definitely it's not a case of merely washing with water and wiping will lead to all this spiritual benefit. It has to be because the wudu has esoteric dimensions to it. If you do the wudu with this meaning, then you would reach a spiritual status that Allah will give. Ayatollah Hassan Zoda has given this as an instruction for the common lay person, someone who's one of the most learned in the Tariqah. Now, 
although I have to say this, if you want to practice it, do it once a day. Not every time, for example, you go to the lavatory, because you'll burn yourselves out. It's like with other things, the mustahabbat, you know, salatu layl and other actions. You start with 11 units every night and eventually you burn yourselves out and you forget about it. Here too, only do it once a day. After a few weeks, okay, if you have the courage, do it twice a day and then stick with two. You'll know when to do more yourself. But the wudu, every component of it has an esoteric dimension. That has to be acknowledged. I'll just give one example of one of the esoteric dimensions in Imam Khomeini's Adab al Salat. He refers to one of Ibn Arabi's books and says there are 150 dimensions, esoteric dimensions, in relation to the wudu. I'll just give one of them. When you wash the hands, you start from the elbows, a bit higher than the elbows, and you go down. This elbow is a joint. It's an important cause of your many affairs that you do during the day. This joint is symbolic of a cause. All around us there are causes. This microphone, microphone is a cause. This tissue, the car, the food that we have, water. All these are causes. When we do the wudu, we have to acknowledge wholeheartedly that Allah, I'm washing myself off all the worldly causes and I see you as the sole self-sufficient cause. And what does that mean? When you go to the grocers and the grocer gives you food, you don't see the grocer as Razek. You see Allah as al razik You thank the grocer, it's okay, no problem. But you don't get drowned in the grocer. The cause isn't the grocer, it's Allah. And you have to be attentive of that. A kind of hudur focus has to be there. You go to the doctor, he gives you medication, you get cured. You thank the doctor, okay, but the Shafi, the cure is Allah. You have to be aware of that. You put the alarm on in your car. Hafid is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't get drowned in the alarm. In every action, you do 10 to 20 actions every day. Play with Allah's names. See Allah as the sole cause. Now, someone who does wudu, always attentive of this fact, that the spirituality has to be growing with time. It has to grow. It's not a merely physical thing. If it was merely physical, Allah wouldn't have given us it in that particular order and everything. There are much simpler ways we can just do a physical washing. So this is important. We have to pay attention to the esoteric dimensions of religion. Then we come to the Tariq, chapter 72, verse 16. If they hold fast, if they are steadfast on the Tariq, on the path, the path to Allah. We shall most certainly, most certainly satiate them with abundant water. Now this abundant water in one tradition from Imam Sadiq is divine knowledge. Divine knowledge is guaranteed if you're on the path. But this path isn't confined to the Sharia because there are many things outside the jurisdiction of the Sharia which make people unethical still. This is the tariq dimension of Islam. The water is divine knowledge. Here the Ma'asum has given the meaning of the esoteric dimension of this verse. That divine knowledge isn't just doing all the Vajibot and Muharramot. There are many people who do it, but they're awful people. Shem would do Salat every day. He would do all the Vajibat. 
But there was no taste in his Vajabhat. When there's no taste, in, especially in, in relation to the Mustahabhat, if there's no taste, he would do Salatul Layl every night. If there's no taste in the Mustahabhat, it's going to enhance one's ego. You can't play around with these things. You can't kid yourself. This is the internal, the inner, the esoteric dimension of Islam, the tariqah, the path to Allah, the spiritual path. These are the actions of the Holy Prophet now. And this we mean the noble ethical traits. I've been sent to complete the noble ethical traits. Our Holy Prophet has been sent to manifest the Muhammadan soul that he had through his actions. The noble ethical traits, here we're entering the tariqah now. Forgiving, someone's done you wrong. They know they've done you wrong. You know they've done you wrong, but you go and, you go and forgive them. Instead of you know, continually eating yourself within that this person's done that and you won't grow like that. Someone suppressed you financially. Now they're asking for money. You donate. Now we're getting to the real, nearer to the inner message of Islam. Someone breaks family ties with you. For no, you know, good reason or whatsoever, you, you eliminate the ego. You go to them, you maintain family ties. Don't lose the plot, we want to see. How to see, we said, the ego has to go. How does the ego go? Sharia tariqa. In Islam, we believe in absolute forgiveness on one-to-one -one relationships. Whatever someone does to you in one-to-one -one relationships, the course of action is forgiving. We too believe in turning the other cheek. There's no end to forgiveness in Islam. We have this in one-to-one -one relationships. Yes, when it comes to matters of the community, you can't forgive on behalf of the community that you have to work in the best interest of the community in those cases. But on one-to-one, -one, everyone to their own capacity, see how much you can take, wholeheartedly though. See, here this is outside the jurisdiction of the Sharia now. Holding on to grudges, it's not haram, but it contaminates the soul. Jealousy. If it's not expressed, that is, inside, that being jealous, it's not haram. It's not haram according to the Sharia. But ethically, according to the tariqah, it's contaminating the soul. The firmer, the stronger that scaffolding of the Sharia is, the more productive this realm will be. Now you may say there are many kuffar or non-Muslims who are very humanitarian and actually they always forgive and they always donate they don't hold on to grudges and that's very good too all these things are very good that they have no one's denying that but it isn't spirit raising for them it doesn't elevate their soul when they do it if there's no Allah in the picture that's why we say, master the Sharia. The better you master it in Tariqah, it will be more productive. The more you succeed in the Tariqah, the more you will elevate the soul. But a Sharia-less Tariqah, no, it won't elevate the soul. It won't make you acquire divine proximity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, then we come to the Haqiqah, the states of the Holy Prophet. I don't worship a Lord that I don't see, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
not with the physical eye, of course. Tasting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the states of the Holy Prophet. Be me. I will assign you like myself, Allah says. There's no limit to the to insan, to man. We can acquire unity with Allah with awareness. Now someone may say, but the Quran says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There's nothing like Allah. How can here you're saying that Allah says that I'll assign you like myself? But the thing is this, the Quran says, Laysa ka mithlihi. See? Ka mithlihi. There's no one like Allah's like. Referring to the Masumin. See, but to translate the calf, why is it regarded as superfluous, as za'id? There's a reason here. You have to pay attention to this, these kind of points. People like Amir al Mu'minin, there's no one like him, the Holy Prophet, and so on and so forth. Allah Metabotabi has said religion comprises of haqa'iq, the haqiqa. The way to the haqa'iq, the states of the Holy Prophet, is the tariqa. The way to the haqiqa is the tariqa. The way to the tariqa is the sharia. Actually, that's a scholar speaking now. Very beautifully summarizing everything there. Now, there are a few traditions I want to go through. Some of these traditions are weak. Some are sound, none of them are mutawatir, but they do have tawatir in meaning. No particular tradition exists to such an extent that it leads to one's certainty. But meanings of such traditions, the meaning is so abundant that it does lead to certainty that these things exist and is haq. Man Asha from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Man Asha fi Dahir al Rasul fahuwa Sunni. Whoever lives on a par with the external dimension of the Holy Prophet is a Sunni. Sunni, the, the literal meaning of it, not the technical sense. One who does the Sunnah. وَمَنْ آشَ فِي بَاطِنِ الرَّسُولِ One who abides by the inner aspects of the Holy Prophet فَهُوَ Sufi. They are Sufis. It's a dimension of Islam. It's Irfan. And I will speak more about it in a minute. Now, sometimes we see the Imams attacking the Sufis. Sometimes we see Sufis attacking Sufis. With the introduction I gave, that's because that brand of Sufism, that type, that method of Sufism, which is a science. Tariqa is a science. Sufism, Irfan, these are sciences. What is Irfan a science of? What is Sufism a science of? It's a science of Tariqa. Sufism is Tariqa orgy. The way to get to that spiritual path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has principles and everything extracted from resources. When you see Sufism being attacked in many traditions, it's that aspect of Sufism which separates itself, distances itself from the Sharia. Not in absolute terms. In the domain of the Sharia, although I didn't want you to abuse what I'm about to say, but in the domain of the Tariqa, there's no Sunni Shia issue. Sunni Shia is in the domain of the Sharia and theology and Kalam. But in Tariqa, we don't have a Sunni Shia issue there. 
And that's why all Sunni tariqas, they all admit and confess that it's all traced back to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now, in the tariqa, there are many pivotal principles. One of the important essential principles in the tariqa is abandoning the world. Now, that doesn't mean you go into a small hut and distance yourself from everyone in the world. That's not meant here. There are different ways of abandoning the world. One is doing everything, going to the grocer, the alarm in the car, going to the doctor, but with everyone you see Allah as the cause. You're filling your heart with Allah alone, whatever you do. That's also abandoning the world. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِ Allah hasn't put two hearts in anyone. You can only occupy the heart with Allah or the dunya. You can't love both. Allah So it's that detachment from the world, it's important. But there are different ways to do it. If you see Allah in all actions, that also, although you're eating, marrying, going to work, doing all different things in this world, it's all good. But you're seeing Allah every single time and recalling Allah, that's also abandoning the world. Abandoning the world has different degrees. Now, once upon a time, abandoning the world was wearing woolen clothing. Suf, wool. Now, from time to time, place to place, the masadir, the, the applications may alter. The principle, though, is abandoning the worldly life. That's the principle. Its manifestations may differ from time to time. Now, I'll mention two traditions here, I'll, from, both from the Holy Prophet. Alaikum bilibas is suf. I enjoin you to wear woolen clothing. Tajiduna hilo watal iman fi qulubikum. You'll taste the sweetness of faith in your hearts by wearing woolen clothes. Man labis a suf raqqa qalbo. One who wears wool, the heart becomes tender, becomes more accommodating spiritual, more spirituality wise, becomes tender, softened. Now look. Does wool have these two effects? Is it the wool itself which is making the heart softer and softer towards Allah? Is it really the wool itself that is making one taste the sweetness of faith? It can't be wool. This is a code. The principle, the underlying principle is detaching from the worldly life. Now, once upon a time it was wool, okay. But the changes, the physical aspect of the manifestation may alter with time. But the principle is that of detaching from the worldly life. And there are many traditions which give many examples of how to abandon it. For reasons of time, because I want to progress quite a bit today. We'll skip those. Hubbu dunya ra'asu kulli khati'ah Love of the world is the root to all sins. Now, Imam Khomeini has given a commentary here. Sometimes there are many actions which aren't canonical sins, they're not haram according to the Sharia, but it contaminates the soul. If you keep on doing them, although you're not sinning in the domain of the Sharia, 
you keep on contaminating the soul, it leads to a certain threshold after which you become susceptible to do haram actions of the Sharia. Like holding on to grudges, being jealous, never forgiving. These are sins but in the ethical realm, in the tariqa realm. Then there's one step higher in the Irvani realm. They are loving a car, loving a house, loving a book. Because you can't love something and Allah at the same time. But you love the car. There's nothing wrong with it. Loving a car, loving a big house. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not haram. It's not unethical. But it is un Irvani like. Because you're not recalling Allah. As you don't recall Allah, the more you don't recall Allah, the more you're contaminating the soul. Even though you're not sinning. And if that contamination reaches a certain threshold, it will make you more susceptible to do ethical sins and eventually Sharia sins. Imam says, Hubbo dunya ma'asum. The ma'asum, Imam says this. Imam Khomeini has given a commentary to it. The tradition is, Hubbo dunya ra'asu kulli khatiyah. See, it's important. And from a young age, we have to teach this to our children. It's too late, you know, if it you know, passes by. So, Sufism or Irfan is defined as Tariqaology. Irfan is a science. Sufism is a science, Tasawwuf, and it has principles. And we get help from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, from verses of the Qur'an, to guide us in this regard. Now, Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh, in one of his works, has written, Irfan is the science of building man, which in effect involves the soul's ascension to knowing Allah and its elevation by incorporating the divine, lordly attributes within oneself, in the tariqa, you want to incorporate Allah's attributes. If Allah is sabur, you want to be patient. If Allah is ghaffar, you want to be forgiving. If Allah is karim, you want to be dignifying to others. You want to manifest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to incorporate those attributes. You can't do that if you're distancing yourself from the people. You have to be with the people to learn how to forgive, to learn how to be patient. You have to go through the most difficult of tests. But most of us, we fail in those tests. And we like to stick to the domain of the Sharia. We don't have the courage to go higher. So it's Irfan is the science of building man, which in effect involves the soul's ascension to knowing Allah and its elevation by incorporating the divine lordly attributes within oneself, and to discipline oneself with the divine etiquettes. An Irfan-less community is tantamount to a lifeless corpse. Yes, it's a very heavy words. True Irfan, he adds, is made up of the logic of revelation and the traditions issued by the Ma'asumi. Now, Imam Khomeini, in one of his works, has written this. Sufis and Urafa, Sufism and Irfan, which are commonly used terms. Their usage, however, are usually not observed, and there is, in fact, a difference. Irfan is that science that explores the levels of oneness of Allah and his manifestations in a manner dictated by Irfani taste, as well as exploring the fact that existence and the order of the cosmos are all manifestations of absolute beauty and his essence, acknowledging that Whoever has knowledge in relation to this science is called an arif. Whoever has knowledge of the fact, acknowledge, whoever has knowledge of 
how one can acknowledge that Allah is Huwal Awal Huwal Akhir, Wal Dahir Wal Batin, whatever is, is a manifestation of Allah's attributes, and has knowledge of how one can acquire and succeed along the path to see and taste that Allah is Huwal Awal Huwal Akhir, Wal Dahir Wal Batin, is called an Arif, Imam Khomeini says. But he says, and whoever converts this knowledge, because both these types of knowledge are still theoretical, whoever converts this knowledge to the practical dimension, transferring it from one's aqli dimension into one's heart, such a person is called a Sufi. That is using the word, someone who was a mujtahid in Irfan, akhlaq, philosophy in his 20s, he's understood everything, he's looked at all the traditions, he's looked at all the verses of the Qur'an, this is his, this is important. Sufism has a quite a lot of negative connotations, that's a given, I agree, during the centuries it's happened, but it's a necessary part of our religion, it's not canonically necessary, that which is vajib is a minimum, that minimum won't elevate the soul. You want to go high. Ta'alau atlu alaykum. You want to go high, then Allah will reveal upon you, recite upon you. You can't limit yourself just to the bare letter of the law. And Khomeini is now speaking in this language. There are two ways that Sufism has been and Irfan has been abused. One way is those who just segregate from the Sharia. That's one way that it's been abused. It's very unfortunate and the Sharia, as I said, it's the first step, it's the minimum, but it's the essential step. Without it you can't grow. But another way it's been abused are these pseudo arifs these people who claim to be sufis and arifs when they're making a business they have an ego problem and they're getting money from people they're making claims there's no taste of religion it's all false in relation to this second group in Imam Khomeini's 40 hadith, he has this important segment. I want to read it out. This is one of those very key passages of 40 hadith. He says, The Arif who disdains others on account of his pride in relation to his mystic knowledge and considers others superciliously to be superficial and shallow. What knowledge does he possess about Allah? Those who have Irfanic knowledge, but they see others as superficial and shallow. This has been translated by the late Mahlaga Oli Qarai. She was martyred in that passenger airline, when the, the Iranian passenger airline, when the RS, yes, when the RSS Vincent bombed it down over the Persian Gulf in the 80s. She was in that plane. And uh, I'm just reading her translation. This is not my translation. The others were my translation, but not this one. So those who, just because they had the knowledge of Irfan, they look upon people as being superficial, shallow. They have this ego problem. And mom says, what knowledge does he possess about Allah? Except for a handful of concepts and terms that are in reality veils of realities and hindrances in this religious path. So he's only learned a number of concepts and terms of Erevan. But there's an ego problem. He has a problem. He doesn't know how to treat people. There's no, there's no taste of religion in them. He's just learned a few concepts. These concepts are going to act as a barrier to Allah for him. 
What is this knowledge except for a number of glamorous and gaudy terms which do not have any relevance whatsoever to the knowledge of God? See, it's terms that one is playing around with. How far are they from the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his names and attributes? Because if you really incorporate Allah's attributes within you, You'll never behave like that. You can always tell if an arif is a pseudo arif or not. In Adab al-Salat, Imam gives the criteria. He sees ego. Look at the ego. If the arif, so-called arif, has an ego problem, he's following a false discipline. How far are they from the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his names and attributes? Knowledge is a quality of the heart. And in the view of this writer, referring to him, all these are practical sciences and consist not of mere acquaintance with certain abstract concepts or artful juggling of terms. With this short life and limited knowledge, see, Imam, see, with this short life and limited knowledge, I have seen certain people amongst these so called orafa and other scholars who, I swear by Irfan and knowledge, that these terms have not made any mark on their hearts. Nay, they have rather left on them an opposite effect. My friend, the knowledge of God, and the translate the Farsi translation was, Ir, the Arabic was Irfan Billah. She's translated as knowledge of God. It's Irfan in relation to Allah. My friend, Imam Khomeini, writes, the Irfan of Allah makes the heart a place where Allah's names, attributes, and essence are manifested. A stage for the appearance of the real monarch who obliterates all signs and purges it of all stains and removes from it all limitations. You fill the heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the real monarch, the real king. You fill the heart with Allah's attributes, it will obliterate all traces of the ego, all contaminations of the heart. Then Imam gives a verse of the Quran, very delicately, incredible. Going into the Butun again, the esoteric dimension of this verse. The verse he mentions is this. On superficially, it has no relevance to the context of this page. That's why we have to go to the esoteric meaning, not limit ourselves to the exoteric meaning. He says, قَالَتْ إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا This is in relation to Queen Saba. She wanted, she was consulting with her cabinet. What are we going to do with Suleiman? Then the cabinet said, look, when kings enter a town, they destroy it, they ruin it. And when they enter the town, they degrade the men of honor of that town. Now what relevance does that have to Irfan and what we're speaking about? Here this is the meaning, the esoteric meaning that Imam says maybe this is the esoteric meaning. The kings are Allah's attributes. When it enters the heart, the town, it ruins it. It kills the ego. That me, I am this, I am that, I have honor, I have this, that ego problem. When Allah's attributes enter the heart, it obliterates all this. That's the esoteric meaning of this verse. Then Imam continues. That real monarch, it converts your heart into a mawahid and one filled with the praise of the Lord. But why then did it make your heart a place of your own glorification? Why has it added unnecessary colors to it and accumulated trappings and accretions that deter you from obtaining nearness to God Almighty and from beholding the effulgent glory of his names? Why it has made your heart an abode of Satan 
And so you look down on the servants of God and his chosen, the signs and reflections of his glory and splendor. Erfan should make you elevate, love everyone, treat everyone, kill your own ego, be inferior to everyone. Woe upon you for your wretchedness, O RF, this kind of Erfan, whose condition is worse than of anybody else, and all the doors of defense and pretext are sealed upon him. You are proud towards God and have assumed a pharaonic arrogance towards his names, attributes, and all the manifestations of his essence. You've become a pharaoh. You've used these terms and made yourself enter the abode of shaitan. O oh, amateurish student of concepts who has gone astray of the realities, deliberate over the matter for a while and think as to what knowledge you possess of God. What impact has the knowledge of God and his attributes made on yourself? Okay, and that we end there. Now I'll stop here. Now I want to go and read a few words of Mosiba. But before I want to read this Mosiba, continuing from last night, there was just one dilemma I want to mention. Although I've spoken about this before, I thought maybe some of you may have seen it. I didn't want to repeat those lectures on women, which I gave last year. And we covered a lot of aspects in relation to the woman from an Erfani angle. There was one dilemma which I didn't touch upon in those lectures. And I want to just clarify this. You see, there are some things in relation to the woman and in general in relation to the woman that it's been badly represented. Polygamy has been badly represented and explained. Motto has been badly represented and explained. It's a very poor interpretation we're seeing of these concepts. But that concept I want to touch upon here is the hitting of women that we see in the Quran, apparently, what this means. And I want to just give one interpretation here. First, I want to go through two traditions, both from the Holy Prophet. Ayyadrebo ahadu kumul mar'a thumma yadillu how is it that any one of you hits the wife, hits the woman, and then hold her into his arms? It's a rhetorical question, meaning these two hitting and holding into the arms are a contradiction in terms. In another tradition, now, I don't want you to panic with this tradition. Let, let me finish the point, explain it all and then everything in Shona will fall into place. The Holy Prophet says, Inni ata'ajjabu mimma yadrib imra'atahu wa huwa biddarb awla minha. See, I'm surprised of one who hits his wife, but is more deserving to be hit. La tadribu nisa'akum bil khashab. I'll explain all this now in a minute. Don't hit your women with wood. But that, I'll explain that. فَإِنَّ فِيهِ الْقِصَاص By doing so, there's qisas in that. Because in the Sharia, it says you can't hit anyone and lead to a change of their color. There's blood money you have to give. It's haram. He says don't hit with wood because it changes the skin color. The, the, there's going to be retaliation there. Besos, blood money. While our kin, however, or rather, idrubuhunna hit them with hunger and absence of clothing. Hatta torihu fit dunya wal akhara, so that you may be at peace in this world and the hereafter. 
this needs explaining. In Islam, the woman has no duties to the husband, except for one or two. One of those two is that of tamkeen, sexual gratification, when the man wants it. Uh, naturally, if the woman is ill, doesn't feel like it, no. I mean, she, she can refrain. But refraining without an excuse is not allowed. The man has a hundred and one wajib duties under the umbrella of the nafaqe to the woman. If the man doesn't do those nafari duties, the woman can refrain from doing those two duties. If the woman doesn't do those two duties, the man can refrain from the nafari. This is all in the Sharia. Here, it's saying idrubuhunna bil wal ura. Hit them with hunger and absence of because the nafare, the man has to provide that food, clothing, shelter, accommodation, travels that the woman had before she was married in that household. Depending, every household is different. The socio-economic status, the or differs. Whatever she had before, food-wise, clothing-wise, shelter-wise, travel why she traveled to Plaise, for example, whatever. That has to be maintained. Nafaqa is the maintenance. That's the responsibility of the man. And the woman only has those two duties, nothing else. The rest, these are. He is saying hit them with the nafaqa. Very simple. Itrubuhunna bil ju'i wal ura. Because she's gone astray in her duty without an excuse, in one of those two, you reduce the nafare. So hit them with hunger and the clothing. Now, if she's earning herself, that's going to be a problem for you. Because that's her money, she can do whatever she wants with it. But that's the meaning of hitting. That's one meaning at least. Another meaning is hitting with toothbrush now something very let's say something like that this size from a tree which has a very soft surface area I've forgotten the name of the tree here it says hitting now it doesn't say it I know on like you know stabbing them or poking them or that kind of thing hitting like something like this with a piece of wood, toothbrush. Now you do that however much you want, the hardest you want, it will not change the color of the skin. It doesn't even hurt. Now if you just pay attention here, because this verse, which has been used by in the West as the most violent of verses, in fact is the most sensitive and delicate and compassionate verses of Islam with this explanation. So this hitting either hurts because it's much thinner than this pen. It's a very thin toothbrush. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't change the color of the skin because if it changes the color of the skin, there's blood money, it's haram, so you can't do that. So what is this all about then? Why is it important, this hitting, if it doesn't hurt or anything? Now, in the Quran, chapter 4, 34, it first says if the woman refrains from that sexual gratification without any excuse, if she does it once, that's not, you know, as, it's not as if a zulm has occurred. It's something she's continuing with, without any excuse, not only once or twice. The Quran first says, فَعِذُوا هُنَّ Counsel them. If it doesn't work, وَحْجُرُوا هُنَّ فِي الْمَثَاجِ Turn away from them in bed. Now look, this point is important. In Amr bin Ma'roof, Amr bin Ma'roof is vajib. If you deem it to be effective, if you deem it probable that it will be effective to the woman, you do Amr bin Ma'roof. 
or to anyone else. Otherwise, if you do Amber Ma'ruf and you know it'll have no effect on the other person, it's not for to do Amber Ma'ruf. So then you turn away. If that turning away won't have an effect, then you don't do it. Then it says, hit them. Now let's take the hitting with the toothbrush, which doesn't even hurt. It has to have an effect on her, this hitting with something like that. Now what does this mean? It means man and woman, the relationship, should be so sensitive that even something like that, okay, is having an effect. The woman will feel okay, will feel disappointed. I mean, if the relationship is just shouting, swearing and everything, none of this will work. This verse is showing how the relationship of a man and woman should be, should be so high that something like that will have an effect. Because if you don't deem it probable for it to have an effect, then it becomes aborted. You see how then things become different now. These are two different interpretations of this verse. And all this is only in relation to that one sin. Not in relation to other things, no. There it's total freedom. You can't do anything. It's only in relation to this one thing this protocol is given. See, this is very important to understand. Okay. Now, yesterday I went through a letter which the second Khalifa, during his Khilafah, wrote to Muawiyah, who was a governor, explaining to Muawiyah what he did after Saqifa, though. And it was a long letter, so I went through half of it yesterday, and I'll continue with it now, the rest. So I grasped, and Omar is saying this, so I grasped the whip of Qunfuth, فَذَرَبْتُ And I hit her. Now, this zaraba here is a serious hitting, because the context, it's with a whip. It's not to just, because that rabbi has many meanings. One is just placing or pressing upon. But here it's a serious hitting because the context is saying he got a whip. And Omar, he said to Khalid ibn Walid, Anta wa rajaluna halimu fi jam il hatab. You and our men hasten in preparing wood. Then I said, I shall set fire to the house. فقالت, Lady Fatima then said, Ya adawwa Allah, wa adawwa Rasulihi, wa adawwa Amir al Mu'mineen, O enemy of Allah, O enemy of Allah's Messenger, O enemy of Amir al Mu'mineen. فَذَرَبَتْ Fatima. Yadiyaha min al bab. Here again we see zaraba here, meaning placing upon, not even hitting. She has different meanings. She placed her hands behind the door. Tamna'ni, preventing me from open. Tamna'ni min fatihi, preventing me from opening it. Faramtuhu, I wanted to open it. It was difficult for me. And I hit her hands with the whip. So it would hurt her. I heard her whining and cries. An aliyana wa an ghaliba an al I, Omar is saying this, I was almost becoming softened and I was about to leave from the door. Fadakartu ahqada ali. But I recalled the grudges of Ali. Wa wulu ahu fi dima isanadid al Arab 
and his thirst for the blood of the great Arab tribe leaders. So I kicked down the door, or kicked the door. وقد ألسقت أحشاءها بالباب تترسه whilst her stomach was adhered to the door hiding behind it وسمعتها وقد صرخت صرخة and I heard her utter such a high-pitched piercing cry حسبتها قد جعلت أعلى المدينة أسفلها I thought that Medina was being capsized. وقالت, and she said, Ya Abata, O oh Father, Ya Rasul Allah, O oh Messenger of Allah, Ha Kada Kana Yafalo, Behabi Batik, Wabnatik, your beloved and your daughter is being treated in such a manner. Oh, Ya Fizza, O oh Fizza. Ilaiki, come to me. Fakhudini, hold on to me. Fakad walla qutila mafi ahshai minham. That which is in my womb has, I swear, been killed. Allah, 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 Allah,